Welcome to week nine of HI3286, and it's another great week in researching history in Australia. This week is, in my opinion, a lot of fun because we look at where historians have been fooled and at how it's not always easy to know what actually happened in the past. So we will look at fake news, fake evidence, and fake history. And there are all sorts of ways to approach this issue of things not exactly happening as you would expect. There are deliberate hoaxes, and we'll look at some of those. There are mass popular delusions where people jump on a bandwagon of believing the wrong thing. There is a long history of misinformation, which in these times is extremely topical. And we'll look on that and we'll bring it through to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And we'll look to at why false history persists. Why is it attractive? And there are a number of reasons. Sometimes it's that there are good forgeries which wreck the historical record and mislead historians. Sometimes it's that we want to believe something that didn't actually happen. And sometimes it's not just historians who want to do that. Sometimes historians have recognized that that popular story isn't actually correct, but have a very hard time in getting those ideas out to the broader public. And historians are aware of groups of people getting things wrong in the past, and among those groups of people are historians. There's a long history of fake evidence. There's also a long history of contagious enthusiasms. That issue of fake evidence is one that's explored in a particular case in the reading, but that's certainly not the only example of false evidence being produced and being sold, generally, literally, to willing audiences. And it's sometimes difficult to pull these things apart, to distinguish trickery from willful self-deception. This is the frontispiece of an 1869 book about extraordinary popular delusions. So even in 1869, there was more than enough to produce a book. And it doesn't even include some of the ones which I like to think about. There's that famous medieval forgery of the letter from Prester John. It's a letter from a king who didn't exist, but it makes its way into medieval minds because he should exist. The book, though, does include some of those economic bubble beliefs, including tulipomania, the South Sea bubble, and the Mississippi scheme, where people put their money where their mistaken beliefs were. And it does touch as well on the reproduction and forgery of various relics. So there are all sorts of ways to fake history, and there are all sorts of ways to be misled and one of them is to be misled by your own hopes. And while the term fake news has been around for quite a while, it first appeared in the United States in the second half of the 19th century, it's been a popular term in recent years. This report from the House of Commons is an interesting one, although I think it gets distracted from disinformation and fake news into questions of targeting susceptible audiences and using personal information to do that. The term fake news is a difficult one to pin down because some of it we enjoy, some of it we accept. Our culture has a tradition of April Fool's Day and of April Fool's Day jokes. There are other ways that we engage in misinformation and lying without exactly being deliberately deceptive. So we can be satirical. We can tell obviously tall stories for the enjoyment both of the narrator and the audience. And while we might pretend to be fooled, we know that we're entering into a state of suspended disbelief. The House of Commons suggests that fake news was not actually that useful a term and that perhaps disinformation and misinformation would allow us to get to the root of the problem more quickly. The investigation was itself a response to concerns around micro-targeting during the Brexit and the Trump presidency campaigns. 
and it scrapes the surface on things like deep fakes, but most of its concern is with those contentious campaigns. And those contentious campaigns sent out disinformation to the people it judged would be susceptible to it. So the concern here is about the harvesting of information from social media and other sources and using that to target particular audiences with lies and misinformation in ways that were not visible to the broader public and that couldn't be directly refuted by those involved and disadvantaged by it. It's a difficult topic to deal with though because we're used to persuasive language and political advertising is advertising. It's presenting information in a slanted way to try and prompt a particular response from its audience. And so that definition is fake, is difficult, and it's not really dealt with in this report. So this report tends to get drawn off into questions about personal data and consent, about sharing that information and analyzing it in the way that Cambridge Analytica in particular engaged in, in order to target groups that were susceptible to the particular message being put out. I mention this because it gives you a sense of how deep the history of fake news is and how there are multiple concerns involved. In the reading for this week, there were deliberate fakes designed to earn their producer money. Here, there were targeted messages which might contain untruth designed to prompt particular actions in those who received them and that were invisible to those who might want to counter them. And then there are those issues of hoaxes and other types of tricksters. And there is a mass of material that we might cover in this lecture. I'm going to take you to the bottom of the garden to meet the fairies. It is hard to believe, or I find it hard to believe, that a series of five fairy photographs were taken as evidence for the existence of fairies and in some circles still are. Here's one of those images from 1920. I don't know quite what you're seeing in it, and perhaps you are seeing this as clear evidence of the existence of fairies in this particular garden. The first of these five photographs were produced in 1917 by two young cousins, aged 16 and nine. And they attract a great deal of attention, including the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes books. He printed them in 1920 and he visited the girls. He arranged to give the girls cameras so they could get more photographs of these fairies and so that he would be able to prove that the photos were real. And the photos were, in some sense, real. They were approved as genuine by experts. The experts did say, we're saying this is a real photograph. It hasn't been messed around with during its production, not necessarily that the content of the photograph is real. The interest in the photographs wasn't that long lived. There was a decline in interest after 1921, and it wasn't revived until 1966. But there's still some knowledge of these things, enough that in 1983, the two no longer girls were prompted to confess that the photos were faked. They were faked in that they made paper cutouts of fairies, posed them in the garden, and then took real photographs of them interacting with the cutouts. Although, in that confession, one of the two girls did claim that the fifth of the photographs was of a real fairy. But there's still a desire to believe in these things. If you follow the YouTube video link in the comments, you will see people who firmly support the idea that these fairies were real. I came across these fairies in a book that was on my mother's bookshelf. I expected from the title and the cover and the topic that that book would be an examination of a historical fraud. Then I read it and I discovered that the author was clearly of the opinion that the fairies were real. And this was despite the book identifying the book of fairies that the paper cutouts were made from. The author went through that strange juggle of these fairies appeared in this book, so this book is also evidence that the fairies are real. Someone else has seen them, rather than 
their evidence of where the girls made the cutouts from. And the author believed in the authenticity of these photographs, despite that, despite the confession, and despite the awkwardness of the photographs, which was noted by many of the sources at the time. At the time, not everybody believed there were fairies at the bottom of this garden. And you can judge for yourself too whether you think this is a particularly good way of posing with a paper cutout of a fairy. But if this was a fraud, it was an innocent one. The girls did get given cameras, which would have been expensive at the time, but they didn't profit greatly from it. And it was done in good spirits and because they were bored, rather than as an act of deliberate mass deception. And there are other good-natured fakes as well, and I think the world might be poorer without such things, such as Peter Jackson's brilliant documentary, Forgotten Silver. Forgotten Silver was a documentary about a lost New Zealand film pioneer, complete with plausible explanations about how his work had fallen into obscurity. It was shown in 1995 on television and it captivated the country. There were discussions in the days afterwards about how this film pioneer and his work had been lost. I should note that the documentary began with Peter Jackson literally leading the viewer down the garden path. And I have put an excerpt from this in the week 11 folder of the subject. And one of the difficulties of being a research historian is the amount of suspicion you need to muster. Last week we talked about photographs. You're aware that photographs have been faked in the Photoshop era and before the Photoshop era. All three photographs on this page are in some way fake. The corn one, as you know from the material last week, you can understand is an obvious fake despite being produced in the period before the availability of Photoshop. The one on the bottom right, I faked using Photoshop because I thought I should learn how to use it. And so I inserted a colleague of mine into that summit held in 2018 in Helsinki. I'll let you work out which one of those three men is my colleague. The one on the upper right is less obvious. That's my colleague, Russell McGregor. He's a real person. He's in a radio studio. He did actually do a radio interview. What is fake about this photograph is that prompted by the JCU media person, I said to Russell on the morning, make sure you get a photograph of you in the studio at the conclusion of the interview he asked the radio interviewer for that photograph and the radio interviewer said I guess you'll want the on-air sign on and switched it on. So there's a fake element to this image which is that lit up on-air sign at a time when Russell had already completed his interview. And so if seeing isn't believing sometimes it's hard to know what is. Fake photos can themselves be interesting evidence this pair of photographs is covered in the online material associated with that Faking It exhibition, which I have directed you to already. And this is an interesting comment on Russian politics in this era. Probably the key person in this photograph, if you haven't identified him, is Joe Stalin. And the later version of the photograph, which contains only three men, is a fair reflection of Stalin's approach to people that he decided he didn't like. So I've covered the idea of fake news and the longer evidence of that. I've covered the idea of fake evidence, partly in the reading, partly in this series of images, all of which are in some way or other fake. And now it's worth relating that back to what historians do. Sometimes historians have been deceived by false sources and so write false history. There's that lovely example in the reading and in the rest of the book that it comes from. And it's not just historians that have been misled by evidence that they want to believe. The Piltdown Man hoax, which misled archaeologists and anthropologists for so long, springs to mind. And if you think about it, you may come up with your own examples of when Fake evidence has misled the experts. There are certainly lots of lists of such events online. And then there are the examples too of the gloriously successful April Fool's Day pranks. 
But sometimes it's not the historians getting it wrong. Sometimes it's the historians being unable to convince the larger audience of the truth. This is the contents page of a book called Zombie Myths of Australian Military History. In the introduction to the book, Craig Stocking spends some time describing zombies. I'm going to assume you know what zombies are. His point in that introduction is that appealing stories survive what should be successful attacks by historians. They survive for a variety of reasons. They survive because they appeal to, in this case, the Australian sense of nationalism. They survive, in this case, in terms of military history, because war is awful and making some sense of it, even false sense, helps manage the horror of war. And these military examples are certainly not the only examples of misrepresentations of history that persist within Australia. Another great example has been explored by that colleague of mine, Russell McGregor, and he has explored the way in which the 1967 referendum in Australia is said repeatedly to have granted Aboriginal people the right to vote. It didn't. I've put the link to his article in the conversation so you can explore his own ideas about that. His argument is that the lack of a no campaign at the time meant that the effusive rhetoric around the referendum wasn't seriously challenged at the time, this myth grew, and all sorts of people in the present seem to want to believe it. They want to believe that Aboriginal people in Australia were unable to vote before the 1967 referendum, and that's simply not correct. I'm pulling this to a close, but I hope you can see that there are all sorts of problems with various types of wrong history. There's an awful lot of the past to deal with. Historians love to problematize and unpack the past and have debates about how we should interpret it. Maybe we should be grateful about the zombies because they give us some um, helpful targets and they keep us in business. They also draw attention to the gulf between popular history and academic historians who are worried about evidence and the quality of their interpretations and have the training to make that count. But it can be difficult being an academic historian and seeing solid, thoughtful history well backed up by the best available evidence being thoughtlessly discarded for the more scandalous and entertaining alternatives and often hoaxes False history, zombie myths are entertaining. And we engage with the past and with history, with our emotions, as well as with our minds. We look to engage our readers with the past, and often we do that by reaching to their emotions. But that can be dangerous. Reaching to people's underlying beliefs and fears was a key element in the manipulation of the electorate by Cambridge Analytica and others. We seek to engage audiences with the stories we think they should hear, but those emotions can mislead readers of popular history and they can mislead us as historians. The video excerpts I have for this week also point to how it's difficult to disturb an entertaining version of history. The video excerpts talk about Annette Kellerman, her one-piece swimsuit, and her own faking of her history in order to make herself a hero of women's safety in an appearance before the judiciary in Boston. I look forward to seeing you in tutorial.